injuries, accidents, and illnesses from some of the biggest YouTubers you watch. Let's get started. Pee whoop. Listen. I'm listening, Casey. Talk to me, man. That's a crunchy knee. My knee sounds one to one the same. Okay, maybe not that bad. <laughs> this is the moment of truth. The radiology center's right there and they're gonna like, they're gonna look inside my knee. He went like this as if they're gonna do an ultrasound, which is unique because most people get an MRI. It usually provides better imaging for the deeper ligaments within the knee. And I haven't been totally irresponsible. The minute I felt a pain, I went to a guy, a running specialist. He taught me some stretches. I've been doing it. When he said a guy, I hope he means someone medically certified, right? No, I shouldn't even be able to run. I have no business running. I broke my leg about a decade ago. I broke in 27 places. 27 places. Is this right here? This is all metal. You know, our femurs actually have better tensile strength than steel and concrete. It's kind of cool. The doctor told me, Casey, you're never gonna be able to run again. But I was 26 years old then, and there's no way I was gonna let that doctor tell me I was never gonna run again. I run. I'm pretty sure every video that Casey has made when he was in his like peak Casey era, he was running. So listen, I'll tell you briefly, but basically what I see on the MRI is two things. I do wish that he told the doctor he was recording him. You have something called a plica. It's a piece of tissue that connects on your kneecap and it connects also to your, uh, to your IT band and it pulls your kneecap out of alignment and it causes cartilaginous like wear and tear. Just to kind of fast forward, you can run and you can even run now. I'm not worried. So it's basic, this part of the knee that gets inflamed sometimes through overuse. Kind of is a weird diagnosis, but it's basically a series of overuse and inflammation that is very, very treatable. Popping, cracking uh, is not always dangerous, which is why I tell my patients that unless it's combined with other symptoms, in most cases, it's nothing to worry about. And in that moment, I squat down and let them hear my knees which are pain-free. A little basketball action, two on two. Okay. Oh, I was gonna say knee gave out, but then he cracked his head on the hoop. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, that's bad, that's bad. That's bad. Remember, the scalp bleeds a lot because there's a lot of vital capillaries in this area. You could see it on the image. The superficial damage is not what I would be worried about. Why I'd be worried is we want to make sure there's no fracture and we also want to make sure there's no swelling inside or a concussion. It really didn't hurt that bad. I just think because it's all the adrenaline. Like I wasn't in like serious pain and then I haven't had any headaches since it happened. Well, not being in serious pain in the moment is not unusual. It's also really dangerous and why athletes want to rush back in after they have a concussive hit to the head. In fact, you we even see behavior changes and athletes who experience a concussion. The most painful part was probably they jabbed the needle into my skull. The needle is for lidocaine so he doesn't feel the staples. Which was painful and then they stapled my skull, which was also painful. In many instances, we say don't even use the lidocaine, let's just do the staples because it probably will hurt less and less pokes too. You guys ready? Ready. 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 All right, let's go. As everyone shows up to do the stunt in the middle of the leg. Oh my God. Oh my God. I feel like YouTube videos have gotten to the point where it's how extreme can we be in order to maximize the clickability of the video? And that could be good, but then it could also create a lot of problems. I just jumped out of a plane 20 times. What's the worst that could happen if I swing from a rope over a one foot deep lake? Oh my God, not only did he make contact with the thing, but then he also fell with his leg like that. There's actually a very common injury called the Liz Frank injury that happens when you get tossed off a horse, but your leg is still attached in the stirrup. And that reminds me of that. I wonder if that's the injury that he had. When I woke up in the hospital, I was in shock. I was in a lot of pain. I tore some ligaments in my leg. I broke my foot. I broke my hip. I shattered my skull in nine places. I shattered my eye socket. I almost lost my eye. Yeah, getting hit in the orbit is a very problem 
problematic injury because there's a lot of tissue behind those bones. There's the nasoethmoid area, the lacrimal area where your tears come from, the muscles that attach to that area, which make up your face and the muscles that control your orbital movements, your eye movements, these are all attached to those bones. And if there's enough damage, those muscles can change so much so that your whole facial appearance can change, its functionality can change, your ability to breathe and cry can change. These are big things for a, a human's, not just development, but I guess quality of life. But wow, brutal injury. Glad to see that he's up on his feet and training now. Last I saw, he was actually training with Casey Neistat, who we just saw earlier. Bunch of friends and I woke up super early one day to be overachievers and go to an interactive programming workshop. We all get there and things are going smoothly. I'm enjoying several delicious pastries at no expense to myself, but oh, starting to feel a little gurgly. My bowels were making a movement. Bowels moving means like you're gonna go to number two. Actual burbling inside your stomach is called borborygmy and not a bowel movement. Fun fact. Later, my roommate was talking to his then girlfriend and she was like, uh, uh, that sounds a lot like appendicitis. You should take him to the hospital. Well, I mean, just being nauseous and having diarrhea does not alone point to appendicitis. If you have pain on the right lower quadrant and nausea, fever, vomiting, all these things, that could be indicative. Hey, Andy, <laughs> we should uh, we should go to the hospital. <laughs> At the hospital, I'm asked a bunch of questions. Where does it hurt? How long has it been hurting? When did this start? These are really good questions. It's called OPQRST, and each one stands for something specific. And then the doctor told me, I think you have appendicitis. We're gonna have to move you to urgent care. That's kind of backwards. Urgent care is not as urgent as emergency room care. <laughs> urgent care is like the middle ground between primary care, like in an office setting where I work, and an emergency room. But appendicitis is most definitely emergency room, not urgent care. In the hospital, they take me to the scanner room. They needed to look inside of my sweet bod to assess the situation and to see how dire it was. We look in those uh, situations to see if the appendix is inflamed, enlarged, if it has ruptured, where is the area that's being affected. And also we're trying to diagnose if it is in fact appendicitis. In many instances, it's not appendicitis. It could be something in a related organ, perhaps diverticulitis, which is an inflammation of the intestine through its outpouchings that exist over time. You have like little bouts that pouch out, that's called diverticulosis. And then from there, you can get an infection, diverticulitis. If they put you under for surgery, you need to have your stomach empty, otherwise it can be dangerous. Again, not sure why. Well, the reason why is when you're sedated, you don't have access to your gag reflex so that if you do vomit, you could aspirate whatever that you're vomiting directly into your lungs. And that's problematic. That could cause infection, inflammation, lung failure, very dangerous stuff. To pump the stomach, you have to have a tube pushed down your throat. It's a long piece of plastic that you have to continuously swallow down until it reaches your stomach. And then they can turn it on and get all of the stuff out of your stomach. What he's describing here is a nasogastric tube that goes through your nose and goes into your stomach and we could put it on suction. What's interesting about these devices is that you don't want it to have it to be permanently on suction because then it could actually attach itself to the wall of the stomach and then cause damage to that wall. So you want to do something known as intermittent suction where it suctions, lets go. So it loosens off the wall if it gets caught and then it suctions again and then lets go. Intermittent suction is usually the safer way of doing it. And then I woke up. Appendix cytic, appendix list. I was cured. Oh, Post appendectomy. Hello. Hi. It's time for me to share one of my most deepest, darkest, saddest stories that I ever held inside and not told anyone in over 50 years. That's right. I broke my ass. His tailbone, his coccyx, or his ischial tuberosities? The problem is I get really, really, really motion sick or seasick. And anyone that gets seasick, you know how awful it is. Yeah, that's basically an overactivation of those semicircular canals where if you have hyperactivation of it, it can trigger you to feel nauseous. So I bought this motion sickness tablet, which is supposed to help with it. A lot of these motion sickness tablets that people buy over the counter are usually antihistamine based and those are drowsy, they're sedating. They do work rather quickly on the motion sickness component. I was gonna sit down, everything was fine. It was a beautiful sunny day. We were all drinking beer, 
Alcohol free, of course. I landed on a bench. I, I'm somehow doubtful of that. But the problem with that is you're combining a lot of sedatory effects. You have someone who is motion sick, so their balance is already off. You have someone who is taking antihistamine, probably, which causes sedation. And then they're drinking alcohol, which is also a depressant. You have all three things working against you there. We had to go to the hospital. We did the scan to confirm that, yes, indeed, there was a crack in my ass. I want to know what the ass crack is. If this is a true coccyx fracture, which is a tailbone fracture, coccydynia or pain of the coccyx from a fracture does not really get treated surgically unless there's a major dislocation or displacement. It's just rest, sitting on one of those donut pillows and pain control. And pain control for coccydynia is really, really tricky. It's really painful, really uncomfortable. So on Tuesday, I told my sister that I thought I had a blood clot in my arm. I was like, hmm, something is wrong. Oh yeah, there's definitely something happening, but it looks like there was something worn on the right arm. And there's definitely a discoloration, there's swelling. Yeah, there's definitely something happening that's causing increased pressure in that arm. Woke up the next morning, was supposed to record a podcast, uh, decided that hmm, we have a serious issue. The veins are starting to break in my shoulder. This arm is so Pause. swollen, I looked ripped. That type of venous swelling is telling us that there's some sort of obstructive process happening, that the veins can't be drained outward. Unlike arteries, which are a little bit muscular, veins are thin walls, so they don't have the ability to push the blood out. The way veins allow blood to pass through them is by having little valves that are one-way valves where when the heart beats, the blood goes up. And then when the heart relaxes, the valve closes and prevents the blood from backflowing. Now, if there's a lot of pressure or there's not a lot of room for the blood to travel because of a blockage, those valves start becoming incompetent because the veins with their thin walls start to swell. And that's what likely was happening here, but now that we need to figure out and move up the chain of the body to figure out where that obstruction is coming from. My sister races me to the emergency room and there they do an ultrasound, they find a blood clot. So what we do is called the duplex ultrasound that allows us to see venous blood flow and we can act by giving medications to thin clots, to bust clots, or perhaps go in and remove the clot surgically or minimally invasively. Oh, they wrote deep vein thrombosis. That's a diagnosis that needs to be acted on urgently because if that clot becomes dislodged, it can get shot into the pulmonary system where it then creates a pulmonary embolism. We're gonna have to do a thrombectomy, which is where they take a catheter and shove it into your vein and pump medicine into the clot. That's what we were talking about when I said minimally invasively. We do that, we go in, they put the catheter and they decide that they're gonna do this drug called TPA to dissolve it. I didn't know what that was, I was freaking out. TPA stands for tissue plasminogen activator. This is something we give in strokes. The risk factors to it is bleeding. Bleeding in the brain, incredibly dangerous because it's very hard to control. Bleeding in the arm, dangerous, but you can control that surgically. So definitely tricky substance to give and you wanna give it just in the area where it needs to be. In the brain, you kind of have to send it there. Here, you can be a little bit more accurate and deliver it directly to the spot where you need it. Here we are, third time's a charm. We go back in and this thankfully worked. There she is, clot free. <laughs> and with that being said. Well, my biggest question here is why did the clot form? Because DVTs that are unprovoked deserve to be worked up because there are very specific reasons why we expect clots to form. Like if you're immobilized for a long period of time and you're in bed and you're not moving, that could be a risk factor. If you took a really long plane ride, that could be expected. But if there's nothing that you did that should cause a clot, you should be investigating why that is happening. That evening, after they said that the clot was gone, it was dissolved, I started having chest pains, shortness of breath. I started getting a little worried and something did not feel right. I felt something like traveling. The thing that you wanna really monitor in situations like this is EKG changes to see if that the heart starts acting in any specific way, if you're seeing patterns of pulmonary embolism where the clot has traveled into the lungs. And then also to see if the heart is struggling anyway by drawing serial troponins, which are cardiac enzymes. These are byproducts that are released by the cardiac muscle of the heart when it is damaged. And that usually happens when the heart's not getting enough blood flow, usually due to a blockage. Your girl's been unhooked from the heparin, which means I now have to take pill form, but hey, I had a pulmonary embolism, which means a piece of the blood clot 
broke off and went to my lungs. Yeah, that can happen as a result of the thrombectomy. As we said earlier, you are on medication for a period of time. Once the workup returns for reasons why you would be at risk for developing another blood clot, and that's all negative, then after a period of time, you can come off the blood thinning medication. If there is a reason why you are high risk for clots, you may have to stay on that medication. I have something called thoracic outlet syndrome. It comes in three kind of variations where there isn't enough space between your rib and the vein, the nerve, or the artery to kind of pass through. The area that she's talking about in thoracic outlet is between the clavicle, the first rib, and most importantly, the muscles called the scalenes of the neck, specifically the anterior and middle scalene of the neck. What you have there is a little triangle where the brachial plexus travels through, which is the nerves that travel out to your arm and give sensation and muscle control to your arm, as well as the subclavian artery and vein. So what she has is very rare, but it sounds like there's compression happening of that subclavian vein. Therefore, you have more likely a chance for a clot to form in that area. Amazing that she was able to share all that, survive it, give a, a really good medical explanation. Wow, shout out I Justine. Incredible sea survival stories. Click here, animated, narrated, really interesting. Click here to check that out. And as always, stay happy and healthy.